Well, hi there. You're back here with old Barry on the north coast of the Dominican Republic. And hey, I got a question. I purposely waited about three days before bringing this subject out. I told you I ain't going to be the first horse out of the chute, but I'm going to be very accurate. And continuing with that mind, uh, process in mind, uh, has, uh, maybe one of you guys can answer for me. What, what, what happened to the pandemic in the last three days? It went from every newscast, every page, every headline to you can't find anything on it. Here's uh, Russia Today. Uh, I'm doing this on uh, June 3rd. Okay, you're going to find here everything is about the violence, everything you want to go, NBC, CNBC, anything you want. Anything you want pertaining to just three days ago that swallowed every piece of news that still got the majority of people on this planet running around with a mask on, even though beyond any shadow of a doubt, it's hurting your own body by doing it and doing exactly the opposite. Have you ever reached a point where you're just tired? You're just tired. It's like trying to show a dog a card trick. They're going to sit there and... <laughs> And they haven't got a freaking clue about what you're trying to explain because they don't want to. They're not intelligent enough. Let it go and let the cannon fodder be as it may. Anybody who is not at this point catching on to this about the four primordials, they're doing it again now. Chaos. So it went from a pandemic that swept for the last th almost three months. Every headline you could throw at it to being hard to find in three days. So my question is, what happened to the pandemic? What happened to the COVID? What happened to all the deadly statistics? It failed because enough people are raising question about it. What happened with old Greta? She failed because enough people are asking questions about it. What's going to happen now? They're working towards martial law, just like the mentor said they would be. And you're all going to fight each other. I mean, most of these protests, a high percentage of them in the poorest areas, they have pallets of bricks waiting for them before they start riding. Uh, how many of you are actually aware of, you know, the equal rights for women's lib back in the 60s? I won't even debate the question. Women have every equal right everybody else on this planet does. It's a stupid question. Just because the laws didn't stay, okay. Look who funded women's liberation movement, almost in its entirety, and you're going to come up, if you do your research, the Rockefeller family. And you're going to tell me the Rockefellers care about women's rights? When you find the real information, you'll find, and they openly admitted it was a way of getting the other 50% of the population to start paying taxes. The only way to do it is get them out in the work field. That's what, that's what Women's Lib was initially all about, if you understand it. I'm not saying was it for a just cause, was it right or wrong. In this case, obviously it was right. It should have been that way all through history. But understand the focal point. Understand who's funding the yellow vests that are spreading all over the world that started out over in Europe. Understand who's getting the minorities to start riding in America. After all, a man publicly said he'd be doing it, and he publicly said that's the easiest race to be doing it with. And you're going to find the name George Soros keeps coming up. George Soros, George Soros, the man that almost broke the Bank of England. People start putting this together. And um, if you want to find out what keeps me going, a big part of it is understanding and knowing. I'm going to do one uh, also about symbolism real soon. And it's going to go back to an opening games of the Olympics. Many of you seen it. But I want to point out a lot of the details that many of you went right over your head. And uh, because of, not, not that, you know, because you just don't understand and you haven't studied symbolism. Anyway, I want you to watch this great little video about how to be free in an unfree world, and uh, we'll pick it up on the other side. In such epics where the highest values of life, our peace, our independence, our basic rights, all that makes our existence more pure, more beautiful, all that justifies it, our sacrifice to the demon inhabiting a dozen fanatics and ideologues, all the problems of the man who fears for his humanity come down to the same question, how to remain free. 
In our era of statism, a crisis is a dangerous time for those who value liberty. For with a society myopically focused on the nominal threat of a crisis, draconian bills that limit freedom are easily passed. What makes matters worse is that a population consumed by fear will often voluntarily hand over their freedoms for the promise of a bit more safety. We merely need to look back to the crisis of 2001 to see this playbook in action. The falling of the towers marked the symbolic rise of the modern surveillance state and with it, a death blow to many of our civil liberties. But the crisis that is playing out today has the potential to be far more damaging to our freedom. For governments across the globe have reacted in a way that has revealed a truth that many have long suspected. We live in turn key tyrannies. The technical and socio-bureaucratic apparatus of most modern states is totalitarian ready. Restrictions of movement, limitations on social interaction, heavy-handed control of business, neighbors encouraged to snitch on each other, incessant paternalistic propaganda, and all of this heaped on top of an already intrusive surveillance state and what we have is a form of totalitarianism in action. Some may say that desperate times call for desperate measures, but all totalitarian regimes use the claim of desperate times to justify their heavy-handed measures. But even if this time is truly different and the fate of mankind somehow rests on the imposition of totalitarian rule, the question then becomes when, and to what degree, will we return to times not deemed desperate by the powers that be? Perhaps this threat will subside, but what about the next threat? And what about the potential for crises that are manufactured to instill fear in us for the direct purpose of manipulating us? Are we as a society astute enough to tell the difference? Will the media alert us to this danger? For history is littered with examples of fear being weaponized and used to empower some by manipulating others. Or as Joanna Bork writes in her book, Fear, A Cultural History, Fear is manipulated by numerous organizations with a stake in creating fear while promising to eradicate it. Fear circulates within a wealthy economy of powerful interest groups dependent upon assuring that we remain scared. Theologians, politicians, the media, physicians, and the psychological services depend on our fright. Despite the proliferation of discourses about fear, its eradication has never been seriously countenanced. Substitution of fear-inspiring discourses, rather than obliteration, has been the goal. But a crisis is both a time of danger and opportunity, and while the danger side of this coin should be clear to those of us who cherish liberty, what is its opportunity? This taste of totalitarianism should serve as a much-needed wake-up call. If we value freedom, then it is at times when our social freedom is dying that it is crucial that we reaffirm the one type of freedom that is always under our control, our psychological freedom. Psychological freedom is a cognitive state that entails the recognition that one's government, or any other form of oppressor, can limit our ability to take certain physical actions, but they cannot rid us of our capacity to think for ourselves, to choose for ourselves what is right and what is wrong, and to whatever degree possible to act in accordance with our self-chosen beliefs. Me, in chains? You may fetter my leg, but my will, not even Zeus himself can overpower. Or as Rudyard Kipling put it, the individual has always had to struggle to keep from being overwhelmed by the tribe. If you try it, you will be lonely often and sometimes frightened. But no price is too high to pay for the privilege of owning yourself. In a politically unfree world, asserting our psychological freedom does not require that we openly flaunt the immoral laws of the state. For while civil disobedience can be an effective tool to counter tyranny, it must be done when the time is ripe. Rather, what the assertion of psychological freedom amounts to is a commitment to cultivate what is called our moral autonomy, as a means to better ourselves as individuals and to help return freedom to an unfree world. Autonomy, explains Frank Furity, is an attribute of a person who engages with the world as an active, reasoning, and conscious individual. The etymology of this word, autos, self, and nomos, rule of law, conveys the meaning of self-rule. Or as Furity further explains, Autonomy provides the means through which people realize their potential and character as human beings. The opportunity to act and express oneself in accordance with one's inclination, experience, and reasoning allows people to develop their sense of self and to gain understanding of where they stand in relation to their fellow human beings. It is through the ability to pursue autonomous decision-making that individuals learn to take responsibility for their actions and develop the capacity to assume a measure of responsibility for the well-being of their fellow citizens. Moral autonomy is life-promoting under any conditions, but is especially important at times of social upheaval and rapid change. If this crisis proves significant enough to fundamentally reorder the structure of our society, 
Many of us will soon discover that the ways of life that supported us up until now have become obsolete. Change or perish is the motto of a brave new world, and unless we are willing to take responsibility for our own future, to act with autonomy, and to cultivate the traits that autonomy necessitates, such as curiosity, self-directed learning, a willingness to take risks, and an openness to new experiences, then the only alternative is to place our life in the hands of another. As state power grows, and as governments become increasingly paternalistic, many people turn to politicians and bureaucrats to take care of them. But we take this step at our own peril, for as Jung explains, the increasing dependence on the state is anything but a healthy symptom. It means that the whole nation is in a fair way to becoming a herd of sheep, constantly relying on a shepherd to drive them into good pastures. The shepherd's staff soon becomes a rod of iron, and the shepherds turn into wolves. Any man who still possesses the instinct of self-preservation knows perfectly well that only a swindler would relieve him of responsibility. Those who promise everything are sure to fulfill nothing, and everyone who promises too much is in danger of using evil means in order to carry out his promises. Strengthening our moral autonomy is not only survival promoting in a rapidly changing world, but is also necessary if we are to take part in the task that many philosophers have deemed our highest end, namely self-creation. Self-creation, or what amounts to the unfolding of inner potentials, as we strive to become a more whole version of ourselves, requires the exercise of our moral autonomy. For as Nietzsche wrote, Nobody can build the bridge for you to walk across the river of life, no one but you yourself alone. There are, to be sure, countless paths and bridges and demigods which would carry you across this river, but only at the cost of yourself. You would pawn yourself and lose. In a free society, the task of self-creation is in many ways forced upon us, but as a society shifts ever closer to total state control, self-creation becomes much more challenging as our opportunities for both cultivating and expressing our potential diminishes. This truism is what led Alexander Solzhenitsyn to describe totalitarianism as a land of smothered opportunities. But even though self-creation proves harder in a condition of extensive state control, the size of the task must not be used as an excuse to avoid it. Rather, we should recognize the truth of Jung's words that a man grows with the greatness of his task. Becoming a man or a woman who continues to self-create in the face of an increasingly regimented and conformist world is one of the greatest tasks we can commit to, and is a task that can imbue our life with the meaning and purpose we need to flourish. For as Stefan Zweig put it, only he whose soul is in turmoil, forced to live in an epoch where war, violence, and ideological tyranny threaten the life of every individual and the most precious substance in that life, the freedom of the soul, can know how much courage, sincerity, and resolve are required to remain faithful to his inner self in these times of the herd's rampancy. Only he knows that no task on earth is more burdensome and difficult than to maintain one's intellectual and moral independence and preserve it unsullied through a mass cataclysm. Only once he has endured the necessary doubt and despair within himself can the individual play an exemplary role in standing firm amidst the world's pandemonium. Asserting our moral autonomy and doubling down on our psychological freedom has benefits that extend beyond the merely personal. For in choosing to retain our status as a free man or woman, and in striving to behave in ways that reflect this, we become a force that pushes the world back in the direction of freedom. For contrary to what statist propaganda teaches, Freedom cannot be imposed on us from above, nor is it created or destroyed at the ballot box. Freedom emerges at a societal level when enough of us recognize its value and structure our lives accordingly. Or as Butler Schaefer explains, You and I can bring civilization back into order neither by seizing political power nor by attacking it, but by moving away from it, by diverting our focus from marbled temples and legislative halls to the conduct of our daily lives. The order of a creative civilization will emerge in much the same way that order manifests itself through the rest of nature, not from those who fashion themselves leaders of others, but from the interconnectedness of individuals pursuing their respective self-interests. Fortunately, a shift in a society towards more freedom does not require that we wait around for a majority to recognize the value of liberty. As the study of spontaneous order and chaotic systems teaches, the emergence of a new form of order only requires a tipping point to be reached, and this can be effectuated by a minority of the agents acting in any given system. In societal terms, it can be thought of as follows. In the middle you have the great mass of men and women. Such individuals do not cultivate their own worldview or critically evaluate their value systems. They merely adopt what they see as most expedient. On one side of this human herd, 
you have those who wish to control them, the power-hungry who thrive off the existence of the state, and who are motivated to keep people believing that state power is social progress, and that state solutions are the only solutions. On the other side of the herd, you have those who value freedom, and who understand that human flourishing is intimately tied to freedom's presence. Currently, the scale is heavily tipped toward the ideas of statism, as most people have forgotten, or perhaps never been taught, the great value of freedom. But as history shows, the tide can turn back toward freedom. But this will only occur if enough of us keep the flame of liberty burning at its darkest hours. The great events of world history are, at bottom, profoundly unimportant, writes Jung. In the last analysis, the essential thing is the life of the individual. This alone makes history. Here alone do the great transformations first take place, and the whole future, the whole history of the world, ultimately spring as a gigantic summation from these hidden sources in individuals. In our most private and most subjective lives, we are not only the passive witnesses of our age, and its sufferers, but also its makers. We make our own epic. And it's all about balance, and that's how I live my life, and that's how I changed it uh, over two and a half decades ago. Of course, I'm not saying it's right for anyone else, but I'm not really all that stressed out about what's going on. I understand it. I know how to avoid most of it. And I have no intention of being cannon fodder or a martyr for anybody. That's why um, I come on every couple of days when I have something relevant to say. I have no pressure to be the first horse out of the chute. They're always wrong. Um, just like I say, go to every news media you want to right now. and this. This COVID-19 is like back page. So how did it go from front to back page in three days? That's my question. Where did the COVID go? Where did the coronavirus go? It's all about the, the primordial fears, okay? The darkness, predators, abandonment, and chaos. Human beings are birthed into the physical world with those four primordial fears. When people know how to use those in the psyche, in the psychic mind, and they know how to, to use that against you in the subconscious, it will control you until you understand what's being done. So many people are in, are in that mode right now, and if they're switching from one side to another to another, it's kind of like rolling a dice. It's always going to end up on one of the flat sides. Okay, last I checked, the world was a sphere. It wasn't a square. So it's not, you know, for me, against me, white, black, okay, it's shades of gray. Till we recognize that and we all come together and recognize the people we elect and well above their power, and I stress well above it, to the true elite, have been pulling the strings and keeping us fighting with each other now for millennia. I try People like me try, other good people. You're trying to spread this information. It keeps leading me back to that same question, and I'm going to leave it at that because I'm not getting into that subject yet. Why are we the only species with a fused DNA on our second strand? For those of you that are just saying to yourself, what? Okay, just go, go on the internet and have a look at uh, human DNA or question, is human DNA fused? And you might be wickedly surprised. I know a lot of doctors knew about it when I mentioned it at on our uh, tours or whatever, when people come here to look at investing or relocating. We get into some really good conversations because a lot of these people are trans-oriented people, and that's how they find me. But uh, even many doctors weren't aware of it, and it was like, shut get out of here and look it up and they do it real quick at the table because it's such a ridiculous and it's like oh my okay we're having dinner read it on your own time so i haven't met anybody yet including anybody in the science field and science is one of the things i love to study could explain to me how fusion happens outside of a lab okay evolution you does you cannot fuse dna through evolution. You can change. You cannot fuse. That's a laboratory process. And uh, it does help answer why chimpanzees have two full chromosomes more DNA than we do. So basically, uh, we should be peeling the bananas and they should be designing the Hubble telescope, but it's the other way around. Just some interesting points. 
I bring to your attention to help explain why we can't learn these simple lessons and we keep repeating our same mistakes, killing and killing millions and millions and millions over the millennia without learning our lesson. The people that are controlling it are the people that are our enemy. And all of us, all different races, all religions, everybody else is one. It's the division that they've created by all these beliefs that cause us to conflict with each other. And as long as we're doing that, I cannot see it progressing any further. Awakening is one thing. It's knowing what to do once you're awake is another. And we'll see what happens. But uh, it looks like nature's taking its course again, just looking at Europe, uh, my home country now. Uh, I mean, I, I hear people now waiting in line at a, a Home Depot, which is a big hardware store for those of you that don't have it in your country. And, and uh, you know, if you're not six feet apart, people are pushing each other and they're getting right nasty in certain parts of Canada, too. That is so unlike what I remember my nation to. I know that's a cliche. Everybody's saying that. Anyway, the problem is the less than 1% that control keep us scattered. And now all you see is violence. What happened to the coronavirus in three days? Ask yourself those questions, okay? You're going to find the same names keep coming up over and over, whether it's the Rockefellers that funded women's lib. Of course, women have every right to the same rights. That was not the question. That's a no-brainer. That's a course. But the initiative to start women's liberation back in the 60s, 90% of it was funded by the Rockefellers, and I don't really think they care too much about the rights of women. Uh, and really, uh, very boldly admitting it themselves, it was a plan for them to figure out how do we get 50% of the population to begin paying taxes. And obviously the answer was get them to work. So if you play on the emotions about your rights are being attacked, even though in that subject they were, okay, they got what they wanted. You got to be a slave and punch the clock and try and balance a beautiful home life with a work life. And sure, you may have made a career. I'll more power to you. But regardless of whatever you sell yourself for, it never represents the total cost. So start checking now. The yellow vests over that started in France now are all over the world. The, and, you know, Atifa. All of these groups, and you're going to find the name George Soros keeps coming up, keeps funding. He publicly admitted easily it was the easiest race to manipulate because of the poverty level. He's done it time and time again. The man came a hair close to breaking the Bank of England. I think it was back in the 80s. This is one devilish person. And uh, they do enjoy creating chaos and keeping people in fear. If you're aware of it and abide by it, you're a fool. If you're aware of it and learn to change and live in balance, and that was a great reason why that video was up there. I do a lot of this reporting. It is not my life, nor will it ever be my life. It's not a big deal when I come out with another story or something new, like I'm the, oh, look at me. I got, it has nothing to do with that. You want to pass it on? Hopefully the world will change. We'll understand that we are all together. Our enemies are the ones that are controlling us, that less than 1%. If we don't learn this, we're going to suffer the consequences, okay? no, Nobody up at that level is caring about anybody who's dying. It's rather convenient. Many of these riots have pallets of bricks waiting for them before they start. Nice stacked bricks on pallets. Somebody's dropping them off. Somebody's paying for them. Start doing your research, and you're going to find that name. George Soros comes out along. So here's what to pigeonhole this before I get out. Greta failed. Not enough people went with the climate. That's why you don't see Greta. You don't see her sour mug on there anymore, okay? Two, coronavirus. More and more are waking up. More and more people have had enough. Millions are fronting out information, showing actual fact. Now it's got a lot of people questioning. It's failing. What's left? Martial law. Get the people fighting amongst themselves. And it's their plan B, if you want to look at it that way. I am so glad I am in the countryside right now where at least natural food is growing all around. 
I know even in Santo Domingo and Santiago and places, they've got some, but nothing like we're seeing, nothing remotely. That's what's coming in uh, across as in America, Europe, Canada, Australia. Uh, of course, Hong Kong, that's an out-and-out -out invasion, though. Uh, you know, Hong Kong from the Chinese. So that's that's a little bit different, but all over the place. So keep you in fear. Okay, back to the primordial fears, right? One of them is chaos. There you go. Till next time. So listen, try to keep things in balance, and you're going to be a lot happier, actually, and you're going to make better decisions. I'd start considering, uh, what am I going to do? Now that things are opened up, do I have a job or not? There's another intersection. Decide what works for you. But the violence has merely begun. It's it's nothing at this point. I would say you're about a 10, 10% at best. Because it's just still controlled and its tempers haven't flared to the point that they need to. You got to give that a little bit more time when, you know, uh, when like Gerald Salente says, when people have nothing left to lose, that's when they start losing it. And that will take a little bit more time, but rest assured, you're going to see it. And uh, I would stay out of uh, stay out of the crowd's way. Do not try and uh, be any kind of participant to this, because until we know who we're fighting, till we all understand everybody who's currently fighting each other now, whether I don't care. Do you think this is all about that person that got killed by that cop that was manhandled? Come on, that happens every day. Please. It's just another spark to ignite fuel that's been lying and spread dormant on purpose. They've been dumping barrels of gasoline all over the nation looking for a spark, and they just found it. That's all. Anyway, I hope this makes sense because um, I sure hope a lot of you are going to do something about this because waiting around and uh, thinking this is all going to go away, I can honestly tell you, is not the right decision. And regardless of what you do, just let's hope it's the right decision for you. That's all subjective. I'm not here to tell anybody what to do. Anyway, till next time, it's old Barry, but keep things in balance, okay? And uh, you'll find life is a much smoother, much smoother ride. Talk to you soon. Bye.